If you have your Bible, flip on over to Philippians, the book of Philippians, way toward the back. If you're not familiar with how the Bible works, um, that once you get kind of back towards the end of the Bible, there's a bunch of smaller books. Philippians will be one of them. Um, and we're going to be looking, uh, it, it, just in these couple of weeks, you, you may have saw the graphic a second ago. This is, we're going to call it Thanks Living. Uh, let, let me give you kind of a, a broadcast of where we're headed sermon series-wise so you can prepare. We're going to take a couple of weeks here and just thanks living, just be reminded of the importance of gratitude in the Christian life. Uh, next week you're going to get to hear me interview some of our church family uh, from the stage just about how God has been showing his faithfulness in their life throughout this last year. We're going to just celebrate that as you think and reflect on what God's been doing in your story. And then we're going to transition into Advent season. And we're going to be preparing our hearts for the coming of Jesus at Christmas time. Like we, we don't want to be a church that's, that gets surprised by Christmas, as so many folks get surprised by Christmas. You know, it's a week and a half out and you really hadn't thought about it. Well, not around here because we're going to be talking about it for all the leaks, weeks leading up to Christmas. And um, in, in kind of an Advent time, Advent is an old Latin word that means waiting for the coming or longing for the arrival of something. We're going to be longing for the arrival of Jesus. And we're going to look at a totally different angle this year. We're going to be looking through the ladies of Advent and looking at the women that God used throughout history to prepare the way for the arrival of Jesus. That'll be ex We're excited about preparing that and looking forward to having that conversation. Th then we're going to prepare ourselves for fasting and prayer in January. So we'll do a couple weeks teaching on fasting and prayer, and then after that, we're going to study the book of Haggai together, chapter uh, by chapter, verse by verse, exposition of the book of Haggai, and I hope to do a lot more of that in the coming year. That's typically what we do around here. We study whole books of the Bible at a time. We, we've kind of gone into some gospel topics over the last several months because we felt that we needed to further qualify and make sure that we understood what it is that we had been learning over the last couple of years, but we do enjoy like allowing God's word to drive our conversations on the weekends. We believe he put it together in a certain way for a certain reason. So we don't like to like nitpick verses to put together sermons. We like to let the word of God drive our conversations. So hopefully you'll hang in for those kind of conversations. Today we're in uh, Philippians. Uh, while you're finding that uh, tiny little book, in the back of the New Testament. Uh, I wanted to kind of echo something that our team talked about on the screen before the service, and it's this Rudolph Roundup. Uh, you might have noticed on your way in a couple of giving trees where you could, you, where you could take a kid's name off the tree and, and give Christmas to them. Let me just make sure you understand what that is just in case you walked in late. This is really important. Uh, Rudolph Roundup is our partnership with our local foster care. Um, and so the names that you're seeing on the tree out there are kids in Highlands County that are currently in foster care. It is kids right here in our own backyard. It's not, we're not trying to save the day for a bunch of kids in the other counties around us. Those churches and those communities need to do that. But for Highlands County, Pastor JJ, our executive pastor, called our local foster care system and said, hey, how many kids do we currently have right now in the foster care system in Highlands County? Um, because we're going to do Rudolph Roundup this year, and we want to get gifts for some of those kids. And, and the foster care system says there's 98 kids, currently in, 98 kids currently in foster care in Highlands County right now. And Pastor JJ said, give us all of them. So I believe that the church family of GBC is going to be able to provide 98 Christmases for every single foster kid in Highlands County to make sure those kids have Christmas and get to experience Jesus through your generosity. Okay, so understand, if you grab a name off of that tree, that kid's Christmas walks out of here with you. So don't just throw it into your Bible, don't throw it on your kitchen counter and forget about it. Like if you grab it off, you are committing to either you as an individual or maybe your small group or maybe your DNA group or maybe some neighborhood friends, you're committing to make sure that that kid gets Christmas. This little green card that you see on the front, you're going to leave that with us because we're going to call you to make sure you get it taken care of. We are not letting not a single one of those 98 kids miss out because Grace Bible committed to doing all 98 of those kids, all right? Inside the envelope, you're going to find information on what that, that kid sizes, their wants, their wishes. Um, the, the way the foster care system does it is they allow the kids to put some, a, a bit of a wish list together, but their wants and their needs do not exceed $100, 
It doesn't mean that you'll have to spend 100 but I can tell you that the wish list will not exceed $100. That way you know if you need to grab three or four or if you need to grab three or four people to help you get one done. All right. Um, for example, this kid right here, his name's Dustin. He's 36 years old. Anything gator related, trucks, or maybe a new fishing pole. Ironic, they actually made this up for me so, for my, so I could explain to you how this works. Strangely enough, Emmy, you left my sizes as child size 2T and toddler size 5 shoes. So, but anyway, that'll basically be how it works. You'll take part of this. You'll take the envelope with the information. You'll leave the name and your contact information with us. But I truly believe this weekend we won't leave here without all 98 of those kids being spoken for and having Christmas headed their way this year. What do you think? Good deal. You know, we're coming into the Thanksgiving season, and let's call it what it is. Like, sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes it's difficult to feel thankful and feel gratitude because I bet you some of y'all are going through just madness in your life right now. You know, it really should be the default position of the Christian heart for those, that the, for those of you that are followers of Jesus. Um, it really should be the default position of our heart. Gratitude should be the default position of our hearts. But, but I know, like, we... we, we when we're looking at life and the things that are right in front of our face, gratitude doesn't always come easy because trouble is all around us all the time. You know, I was thinking this week in preparing this, and I actually have taken a lot of notes from Pastor Cameron. Uh, he's actually down in Okeechobee uh, teaching this weekend at Oakview Baptist Church. But one of the hymns that uh, came to mind as we were preparing for this week is the old hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. Like we, we hear those words and that hymn so calls out to us and reminds us. It invites us to make a choice this morning, Grace Bible. It invites us to make a choice every morning to to acknowledge and see God as the fount of every blessing, the giver of all good things, the one who is intimately attuned to all the things that you are hoping for and longing for and feeling and worried about and struggling with, the fount of every blessing. And it is beginning a thanksgiving declaration to God. We talked about confession just a few weeks ago as we begin to invite the giver of good gifts the God Almighty who loves us and is intimately involved in the story of our lives to tune our hearts to sing thy grace. I don't know about you, but sometimes my heart needs a tune up. That hymn declares that to God, tune my heart to sing your grace, to acknowledge that you are present and you are at work. I, sometimes I can't conjure that feeling of gratitude up on my own. Sometimes I really have to begin my thanksgiving by just declaring to God an invitation to tune my heart up, to help me see through the lens of his eyes, to give me a gospel perspective of my situation or my story. And I hope that in this Thanksgiving season, for some of you, Thanksgiving is going to be a natural byproduct of the season that you're in in life. And some of you are going to be wondering how you could possibly give thanks in a time like this. But I hope that you would begin your declaration of Thanksgiving by inviting God to tune our hearts. Tune us up, Lord, to see you, to hear you, to see what you are doing, to trust your hands, trust your heart even when we don't know what's going on in our story right now. You know, we get a beautiful picture, an example in the book of Philippians, and just this really quick nugget of the Apostle Paul's life as he is sitting on house arrest. Some of you been there before. I know you probably ain't telling everybody this morning, but some of y'all been there before on house arrest, I already know. The Apostle Paul was sitting on house arrest for preaching the gospel. He had really committed no crime outside of the simple fact that he continued to declare the gospel in a world and in an environment and in an empire where it was not welcome. 
And so he ends up on house arrest. And so most of us would figure we were counted out. Well, God, what in the world are you doing? I guess I'll just have to wait on you to get me out of this before you can use me again. But the Apostle Paul didn't see it that way. He turned his ministry of city to city evangelism, discipleship, and leadership development. He turned that into sitting in his house on his couch writing letters of encouragement to the Christians that he had met along the way just calling them back to gospel truths in their life, calling them back into trusting Jesus, calling them back into obedience. He continues to write these letters. So what we look at, for those of you that are new to the Bible, as you're looking at these as books of the Bible, they're actually letters to a group of people written by a guy named the Apostle Paul. So this book of Philippians was a letter from Paul to the Christians in Philippi, to the Philippians. Get it? Got it? Good. And I think as we look at Paul's model, we can see some reminders of how we can adjust our hearts towards a gospel posture of gratitude this morning. On your way to verse 12, we're going to really focus on 12 through 14 this morning, but on your way to verse 12, we we can't pass up the fact that the Apostle Paul says these powerful words in verse 6. Not really a part of the sermon, but part of the sermon. So here you go. Free of charge. I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. Wondering where God's at, wondering how he's working in this situation, wondering what to do next, wondering how this is going to shake out, wondering what's going on, Lord. Like, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on into completion until the day of Christ Jesus. He is at work in you. What we talked about last week, we we are being built up as the body of Christ. This is an active, everyday kind of work that the Holy Spirit of God is doing in the life of everyone who trusts Jesus as Lord and King. He is at work most of the time when you are unaware of it. Every good teacher is quiet while you're taking tests, right? And he is doing a radical work of transformation in your life, most of which you won't realize why it's happening because if you're anything like me and I knew God was working on me, I would get in the way because i try to help or i try to stop it. There's some stuff I don't want him meddling with. But he is at work in you, wherever you're at. He is going to carry it on to completion. It's an unstoppable work of God in your life. It is his divine sovereign will at work in you. He is going to pull it off, trust me. And you can trust in him that he is at work in that. And as we arrive in that, keep that in mind, those of you who are trying to reposture your hearts towards gospel gratitude in your life during this season. And we find ourselves in verse 12 through 14 where the apostle Paul kind of lets us into the living room of his house arrest. And he says this, he says, I want you to know brothers that what has happened to me is actually really worked out to serve, to advance the gospel, believe it or not. So that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard, all throughout the Rome, the whole imperial guard, all throughout Rome, and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers even, other Christ followers, he said, most of the brothers have become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, and they're actually getting more bold to speak the word without fear. The first thing I want you to notice this morning as we're reposturing our hearts around gospel gratitude is, listen to me, verse 12, we're going to camp out there for just a second. I've got really long, really wordy sermon points for you this morning, just so you can't write them down, because I didn't want to make it memorable for some reason, I guess. Um, No, but I wanted to make it clear, and I hope you remember it while I'm making it clear. Listen, gratitude requires making more of the good we have than the good that we don't. Gratitude requires making more of the good that we have than the good that we don't. Most of our ingratitude comes from unmet hopes and unmet unmet expectations, doesn't it? It comes from our focus on our lack, doesn't it? You know, I met the thief of joy one time, and his name was Comparison. Oftentimes our ingratitude is because we are so enamored by what we are missing out on or what isn't happening right for us that we miss out on hearts of gratitude, hearts that, by the way, would be full of peace and rest. Gracious, thankful hearts are 
hearts that are at rest, but we miss out because we're so worried about what's not there. And I, I told you a little bit about the Apostle Paul's story, the fact that he was on house arrest. Like if, if anyone had a good reason to have a hard time finding reasons to be thankful, it would be the Apostle Paul in this situation. I mean, what had he done? He was just doing what God told him to do. And by all like practical purposes, it really didn't work out really well in his favor, if you ask me. And just so you know, like some of y'all been on house arrest before and you had to wear your little anklet around. I bet some of y'all on house arrest this morning, you got your anklet on at church. And your parole officer knows that you have to leave here at a certain time to get home by a certain time. Really the main ball and chain you have in your life is that GPS that hangs around your ankle. But understand being on house arrest in the Apostle Paul's time, he didn't have some GPS that he could just roam about the house and still have some independence and freedom within boundaries. House arrest for him meant that he had a Roman guard always chained to him 24 hours a day. They were on shift, but he was always chained to a guy. You ever think about that? I mean, you, you can't go pour a bowl of cereal. You can't go to the outhouse. Some of y'all don't even like it when your neighbors stop by unannounced. And the Apostle Paul is, he, the whole time he's on house arrest, is chained to a guy in his own house, one of these Roman guards. But what's interesting, we just saw in this that because of that, He's got the whole imperial guard on shift, and I guarantee they probably weren't signing up for that detail. So on shift, he just over a couple of years rotates through much of the Roman guard, and I guarantee you, I know the conversation Paul was having with him. He was telling him about Jesus. He was ministering the gospel to them, and those guys are like, I'm never coming back here again. This dude weirds me out. And before you know it, the whole imperial guard had heard the gospel. So that really begs the question, who was chained to who? And that actually brings up a question in my life as I'm learning to acknowledge the good that I have instead of the good that I don't have and wish I had. Like, I wonder what situations in our lives we feel chained to this morning. I wonder what person you feel stuck to in your life that you, maybe it's because you have to keep going to these doctor's visits. You, you're tired of going. You don't want to talk to them anymore about this. You're ready to be healed. You're ready to be set free from that. Maybe it's a coworker or a boss or a neighbor. Like, I mean, what's the scenario in your life that you just feel like you are arrested to, on house arrest with, that you have been chained to? And let me just ask you the question, as we reorient our hearts now to look through a gospel lens, who is chained to who? Is it the lack of favor in your life that God has just forced you into this hard situation? Apostle Paul's out there? Or is it the love of God that he has chained those people and those things to you? That you might be the living display of the life of Christ for them to see. Is that inconvenience that just won't seem to go away? Could it be that it is the fingerprints of God that it is the very presence of God that hasn't chained you to a thing that's uncomfortable, but has chained that thing to you because he is intending on using your life and your story for his glory. Could it be? Who's chained to who? You see, the Apostle Paul shows us as we reorient our hearts around gospel gratitude is the thing that most people would have seen as an obstacle that was in the way, Paul showed us that this is God making a way. Those chains, that house arrest, he wasn't focusing on the chains. I mean, he acknowledged the chains. He, he references the chains. He, he recognizes that those chains are in his life. He's not denying them or saying that it's no big deal because it is. He knows exactly where he's at, but his focus isn't on the chains. It's on the Lord of the chains. Because gratitude requires making more of the good that we have than the good that we don't. Paul recognized that the same God that used David's sling and the same God that used Moses' staff could use his chains for his glory. 
Paul actually goes on to say at the end of that verse, he says, I want you to know that this has actually served to advance the gospel. The word in their language, it advanced uh, in their language, it's kind of like a phrase in our language. The word that he chose there is a phrase that means to, to uh, cut, well, let me make sure I get this right for you. It means to cut before. The word advanced means to cut before, it's like this, uh, those of you that were like uh, military engineering, and I'm not talking about like building stuff, I'm talking about those of you that are like combat engineers, army engineers, for example, that, that would have been an army engineering term for them. It was the group of guys that went out in front of the infantry to, to make a way through the jungle or the forest so that the army could get through. Like their job was to clear a way, to make a way for the whole purpose to get through. This is the word when Paul says, this has actually worked out to advance, to cut through for the sake of the gospel. The thing that looks like it's in the way has actually cut and made a way. The word that Paul uses to, to cut through is this word that gives us this idea of a guy walking through the jungle, making a way with a machete. And the Lord is using that hardship. The Lord of the chains is using that hardship for his glory and apparently so that the whole imperial guard would hear the gospel and apparently to give faith and courage to all of those who already were believers in Jesus. Verse 13 says that this, this became known through the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ Jesus. And most of the brothers have become confident, not only that, but most of the brothers have become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, imprisonment and, we are, and they are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Here's the second thing I want you to notice as we reorient our hearts around gospel, gratitude. Listen closely. Gratitude requires remembering that the context doesn't determine the contents let that resonate in your dome for just a second. Gratitude requires remembering that the context doesn't determine the contents. In other words, life may be throwing a lot at me. Life may be doing a lot to me. But it does not get to determine what the Lord is doing in me and through me and to me in my life. The context doesn't get to determine the contents. What is outside doesn't get to state claim over what is inside. And the Lord is at work. This very difficult situation, this miserable situation of being on house arrest in ancient Rome. The Apostle Paul recognized he had gratitude, he was grateful because he wasn't allowing the context to determine the contents. He knew that God was doing something in him, through him, and to him in the process. And he took great joy in that, he found gratitude in that. He encouraged these Philippian people in that to remind them, a people who were known for their joy and their generosity, to remind them to stay on track with that. No matter what's happening around you, it doesn't have claim over what's happening into, in you because that is where the Lord Jesus Christ rules and reigns, O oh Christian. That's where the Lord gets to have his way. And he even goes as far as putting it like this. Paul says, look, he says, I know, and I just want all of y'all to know that my imprisonment is actually for Christ. Now, he meant this literally and spiritually. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't just simply mean that, well, I'm in jail because of Jesus, even though that was true. Uh, the, word, the phrase that he uses in the Greek, it, it goes way deeper than that. You might want to write this in the margins of your Bible, and good luck spelling this the right way. But in Greek, the Apostle Paul says this, he says, I just wanted y'all to know, and he says it, this phrase in Greek, desmon Christo, which means my imprisonment is in Christ. In other words, I know it may look like I'm in prison, but I'm not because I'm actually in Christ. I'm not imprisoned on house arrest. I'm in prison to Christ Jesus. In other words, God has me right where he wants me. These chains are just the prop. 
it's just the context. It's just the circumstances that surround me, but these chains are just the prop that God has placed in my life for him to have me right where he wants me, doing exactly what he wants me to do. Grace Bible, these chains are just the prop. Listen to me. It's just the context. God has you right where he wants you. He is doing right in you and through you exactly what he wants to accomplish. You bow to that. Don't bow to the chains. The chains are just the prop. That's just the soil where you are being planted. That's just where God decided. Did, did you know, Grace Bible, that it is the will of God for your life? If you are a follower of Jesus, it is the will of God for your life that your life would be a living display of what he is like. By the way, he didn't put that on you. He didn't tell you to go be Jesus to the world, even though we've heard a lot of sermons like that. He said, no, no, I'm going to send my son through the power of the Holy Spirit to dwell within you so that he can be Jesus to the world because you make bad Jesuses. So you just bow your heart to what I am doing, no matter the context, you trust the contents. The spirit of the living God dwells within you, is at work in you, through you, and as you. He is so committed to this end. He loves you so deeply, so radically. He is so committed to you and your gospel transformation and your life being used for his glory that he will do whatever it takes, planting us in whatever soil is best to allow the life of Christ to flourish through you. Are you listening to what I'm saying? All three of y'all, I'm glad. Your life's about to be changed by what you just heard. The rest of y'all. You hear what I'm saying? God has planted you in a soil that is so unique and specific to you. And it might stink. I mean, you ever been to the Belle Glade muck? It's great for that corn. I don't want it in my, in my yard. God is so committed to you that he has created a soil so specific for your story in your life with the divine purpose of allowing that to be part of your, where you've been planted so that the life of Jesus could be displayed through your life best. He's that committed to you. The apostle Paul knows this, so he was reorienting his heart around gospel gratitude, recognizing and remembering the fact that the context doesn't determine the contents. The struggle that you are facing in your life is not evidence of the absence of God. It might be the presence of God. He might be all up in the business. He, he might be the one that is stirring the soil of your life because he is displaying himself through you in a way that you will never know about. But are you willing? Are you willing for your life to be used for that purpose? Are you willing to find out in heaven one day what the purpose of your story was. I know there's so many, so many books and literature out there for Christians to read about how to find your God-given purpose, and that's all well and good, but what if God was at such a work, at doing such a work in your life that he could not tell you about it? That he loved you enough to not show you what he was doing? that you won't get to find out about it until the other side of heaven one day. And you get to celebrate it for all of eternity and celebrate him for it. Would you be willing? Are you willing? Are you, are you willing to lay down every weakness that you have and every handicap and every sin struggle and every fill in the blank for your life? And hear the Holy Spirit say to you this morning that our chains are just the conditions. It's just the context. Don't let the chains fool you. They're just a prop. The very spot God has you is the soil that he intends to display his life through you in. 
will you go as far as this morning, will you make the choice to thank God for the chains? To thank God for the struggle? To invite God to show you the beauty and why he has you planted in the hard stuff right now? The family placed you in, the job that you have, the city you're in, the economic bracket you fall into, are you willing, whatever it is, the disease that you've been diagnosed with, are you willing to thank God for the chain and invite him to use you in it? Continue to surrender yourself to him through it? The last one that I wanted to give to you. I want you to take your Bible, turn the page up like this, and let it fall over. Just turn to the left one page. And now you should be landed in the book of Ephesians. Paul wrote this letter to the Ephesians also while he was on house arrest. He wrote it a little while before he wrote to the Philippian people. And I just wanted to point something out to you. Look at the end of the book of Ephesians, starting in verse 18 of chapter 6. I'm talking about we're at, the, we're at the dead end of the book here. After he's encouraged them, he's exhorted them, he's reminded them of what is true, who God is and what God has done in their lives and who they are as a result of that and what they should do. That, that, that's kind of the theme Paul follows in all of his teachings. And he goes on to say this, he starts to encourage them to pray. And he says in verse 18 of chapter six, I want you to pray at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end. And in other words, making your request known to God, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Don't just pray for you, but pray for other believers and all the believers about the world as the gospel continues to thrive and grow. And he says this verse 19, he says, but I also want you to pray for me. This is the same Paul that wrote Philippians, said, I want you to pray for me, Ephesian Christians. And I've got a very specific prayer. I don't know what Paul was struggling with or thinking about at the moment, but it sounds like that he had some trepidation and uh, in, in, in maybe in, in struggling with the courage to, to, to be vocal about the gospel. And he says, I, I just want you guys to pray that the words would be given to me in opening my mouth to boldly proclaim the mystery of the gospel. Some of y'all prayed that before. Some of y'all feel that this morning. God, I just want you to speak through me. Give me a boldness. Give me the words to say. I don't even know how to bring it up with my friend. And he just prays that the Ephesian church would pray for boldness, that he would be bold about presenting and proclaiming the mystery of the gospel. And he says in verse 20, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare boldly as I ought to speak. That was his prayer to the Ephesians back at the beginning of his house arrest. Fast forward just a little bit of time, still on house arrest. And we read, I want you to know, brothers, what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it became known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And even most of the brothers have become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment. And now they're getting bold to speak the word without fear. What you just saw is Paul prayer, Paul's prayer get answered. And that reminds me of this simple truth as we are reorienting our hearts around gospel gratitude. Gratitude requires recognizing that prayers are being answered even if it doesn't look quite like what we had hoped. I bet you somewhere in the back of his mind when he was telling the Ephesians to pray, he was thinking that God would bust him out of there as God had busted dudes out of jail a lot throughout history. That they'd bust him out of there, that he'd go on to get to preach the gospel and be bold even though he was now in the free world, even though he might still feel the fear of being thrown back into prison, being beaten and being flogged. I bet somewhere in Paul's mind he kind of had in the back of his mind like an ideal scenario of how God could answer that prayer, didn't he? Oh, when God answered that prayer, he made him bold to speak. He used his words and he gave him words, so much so that the whole imperial guard has now heard the gospel and the Christians all throughout the known world have been encouraged and empowered to speak the word of truth with boldness. But he's still sitting on house arrest. 
I wonder, Grace Bible, how many of us need to be reminded that gratitude requires recognizing that prayers are being answered even when it doesn't look quite like what I had hoped. I wonder how many of the prayers are we praying right now that we are praying to God, asking for a thing, but we have already decided for God how he has to answer. Any of y'all or is it just me? Y'all judging me this morning? Hmm? I wonder how many of us have called out to the almighty God of heaven and earth, the creator of all things, the author and perfecter of our faith, the one who is unmatched and unparalleled, the great king of all kings. And we have brought our request boldly before the throne of the Lord. And in the back of our mind, we have already decided how he has to answer it if he truly is God. We've prayed prayers this big, but we've given God this much room to be faithful. Y'all hearing what I'm saying? Sometimes gratitude is taking a step back and recognizing the fact that God is answering our prayers. It's just not looking like what I had hoped. But it is God answering and responding and moving and changing and transforming and working and speaking. And most of us miss the miracle of that because we're looking over here waiting for the answer that we asked for. Yet the spirit of the living God is at work beautifully, microscopic miracles all up underneath our nose, but we're missing it because we have already convinced ourselves that God can only respond this way, and we miss the movements of God. He's doing something in your life. Matter of fact, Philippians 1.6, that he who began a work in you will carry it on to completion till the day of Christ Jesus. He is doing something. And it's powerful, and he's present, and he's moving. Can you see him? Can you hear him? No. Could it be that you're ignoring him because you've already decided for the Lord of heaven and earth what his only right response could be? He is God, and we are not. Not even close. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Grace of Bible, you know, is the will of God for your life. 1 Thessalonians 5 says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks. For this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. The will of God. Gratitude, rejoicing. Yeah. And he's given us all of the gospel resources to learn to see through what is happening to us, to be able to see beyond it with a kingdom lens. As Colossians 3 it says, to, to be able to lift our eyes to things that are above. He's given us all the resources and the spirit of the life of Jesus to dwell within us, to enrich that journey at every turn. Will you trust him today? Will you reorient your heart around gospel gratitude for his glory? And guess what? For your good. Let's pray. Father, have your way in us. You are good. Your definitions of good often don't look like mine. But you are God and I am not. I trust your good over my own. God, I pray that you would help my emotions catch up to that statement. I pray that you would teach me to believe that you would allow my life to be changed by that. Father, I pray that gospel gratitude would pour out through the lives of our church family, even in hardship, that the world might know through our suffering that Jesus is King and 
He is alive. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.